always like to do a shot to freedom. Sure, as long as Joe doesn't touch me. Joe is drinking tea because he's a sick Just to verify that's a kush. Yeah. Freedom! Freedom! That was the most lame shot we've done. Yeah. <laughs> that's because you're not drinking. Oh, right. Yeah, I'm sure that's... Did that's, you make that? No. James, I'm sure that's... Oh, well, yeah, that's nobody right. made it. Yeah. yeah. I thought it was a I fell off a truck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome to Anarchy Roundtable. I'm Joe. I am also Joe. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. I think we have an echo in here. <laughs> that side of the couch is all I'm Christopher up. Cupwell. <sighs> with the hat. Yes, with the hat. <laughs> with the hat. We, we can't see your face. We already trolled the audience. Care. They can see my face. <laughs> Whatever. Trump's going to make America great again. I'm Wendy. I'm throwing up. <laughs> out from what he just said. But I'm just Mike. And this is Anarcho Dog. What's Anarcho Dog's given Aria. Bible name? Her Bible. She was christened, or what is that, when they dumped him in the water? That's, baptized. Yeah, she was baptized. baptized as Her Christian Ariel. name. Her Christian name is Ariel. Ar- is it Arya? Mm-hmm. Arya, okay, whatever, what man. Anarcho dog. Arya is in like a piece of an opera. Yeah. And she has a speed wagon that she pulls Danny's around. Danny's kind of gay, like Arya. Shit like that. Well, no, Danny. <laughs> I was thinking about because Champ was Anarcho dog initially, and yeah. his Facebook got taken down by. Facebook. Really? Seriously? Yeah. It was bad, too, because I used to invite Champ to events. It was a way like to know if she could bring her dog or not. You could no. invite Champ. I'm allergic to dogs, right? But that oh, dog, my apologies. You're, no, your dog and Champ, they're, they're chill. Like, Why would they take down that page? It's not like they're showing... That's weird. I can't. They took it down pages. because... They only want real people to have yeah. Facebook pages. And yeah, real had Facebook to have pages. Somebody. somebody probably did. Remember. Real people, unless you're a transvestite. Or, and they want you to use your real name, too. Grumpy cat. I think transvestites actually are real people. I don't know. I mean, they can only have Facebook pages. So, Anywho. Anyway, um, there's a story that's been going around Facebook like mad in the last uh, several days. Um, so, LA Times article about... We um, saw a tiny house on the way here in Detroit. Yeah, we did. It was an LA Times article about the L- about the LA government um, taking people's tiny houses. Of course, they use the word "seas," but um, I'm not a fan of that word. Um, they're taking people's tiny houses. I guess there's an organization that donates tiny houses to homeless people in LA, and the government has been going around taking them from people and. Um, all of their their stuff, and this is kind of a complex topic that um, I think we should hash out. There's a couple of different things to think about here. Um, you know, one one topic with this is how would you deal with homelessness in a free society? And Capistan. Yeah, um, <laughs> I hate that term. Um, <laughs> Uh, how, how would you deal with homelessness in, in a free society? Um, what would you do about the inevitability? Soylent green. Yes, what, throwing what, it out there. What, That's not a bad idea. What What would you do? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, do you, you want your soylent green made out of homeless people, really? <laughs> I mean... I talked to a guy last week, gamey, you know, <laughs> who was well, into and, you know, it's like eating homeless chicks. And, and, anyway, <laughs> what would you do um, with the inevitability of homeless people squatting on um, areas where infrastructure is? We wouldn't now. Right now, that's government property. A lot of anarchists don't recognize that as property, but in a free society, that would be somebody's property, and they would have the right to kick them off and take their tiny house. Um, and, and and push it off of their land. Well, I think so. Said, if you actually agree with the notion, you know, if no harm, no foul, which is akin to the yeah. nap, I don't think anyone's really going to care unless if if let's say these people live underneath an overpass and the overpass is privately owned by some company or whatever. Okay. Well, if the company doesn't give a shit, then I don't really give a shit. But if the company says no, we can't have this. These people are fucking up our infrastructure somehow, which I can't imagine how it's they would. masturbating in front of the drivers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, yeah, we all do that. two roads and they're competing and people prefer to take the road without <laughs> masturbators. I, uh, I would take the masturbating highway. I'm, 
<laughs> we know, Joe. Look, no. we've all masturbated on the highway. <laughs> I have not. <laughs> you have not. Dave, <laughs> Apparently. Not. Well, you know, it's a little harder for me, though, to drive and, and do that. That so. is true. <laughs> um, no, I, I would think it'd be up to the individual owner of the infrastructure. Yeah. I think Danny's shopping list has a solution for you. God damn. <laughs> <laughs> is that what the kids call it these days? Oh, the my God. Infrastructure? <laughs> I hate you so much. Bro. <laughs> I'm gonna have to figure out a way to get around that because it creates its own hey, wish um, list. Yeah, I've got a little side issue. Maybe we can pick up later. I just want to bring Houston it up now before know, I forget it. Put but it on your public Amazon wish how, list or something. We, we, we gotta have how one. do you deal with um, public property in a wait in a free society? <clears throat> say somehow we became anarchists tomorrow. We're gonna have all this so-called public property that has been being used by. Squatters. A lot of no, or whatever. A lot of different people have been use using it over a period of time. Now, how can someone homestead that property when right. it has been publicly used? We've had we've had assumed ownership by a set of people, right, for an extended period of time. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. So, but the set of people, the whole community has been using this property is, as a public right, park. Their claim is illegitimate, and so now this. Effectively, has reverted back to a state of nature. So, so realistically, it's. But if there's a tradition of, say, a park where thousands and thousands, maybe even millions of people have been using it, who buys it and who do they buy well, it from? Do they buy it, yeah. or who? Who? How can you homestead something that has been continually used? I think you, you know, have to but, come in with guns blazing. Hmm. I know it sounds a little harsh, but if there's a park next, there's a park. But I'm just saying, why it. couldn't there be a concept? Of community property. Well, actually, there absolutely can be. Um, for example, you you move into a neighborhood with a um, voluntary membership for an association, and I, they're talking. bound to have common grounds. A, a, a park effectively is common grounds. The the community. But what about is, something like Yosemite? Say all of a sudden, so this vast government collapses after this uh, wonderful election, and people say, "Wait a minute." Hillary and Trump don't have any clothes. <laughs> so now, you think about Yosemite, right? It, it houses this rich and diverse, you know, ecology. This this wonderful environment, natural beauty that's that's kind of unsurpassed in so many places of the world, right? Meh. A wonderful spot Meh. by many accounts. Danny does not care for it, but I like concrete. Let's say. <laughs> and why don't you shovel your snow so you can see it? <laughs> you, you think about this though. Sorry. How many people do you know I'm hurt. that want to bulldoze Yosemite and turn it into a parking garage? Right? There, there's not too many people uh -huh. that want to do that who aren't Danny Blodgett. I was going to say about twenty percent of the people I know in this room. So. I personally appreciate the natural beauty. I would. You um, would God damn it. It's this kind of show, right? <laughs> Make sure you share that. Make sure you share the picture I took in his bathroom in the show oh notes, Joe. Since since you brought it up, so well, what I'm saying is, the overwhelming majority of people who live even remotely close to that place would probably not like to see it defiled and bulldozed and and turned into you know New that's, York City. Yeah, that's besides the point. My point is is how can someone homestead? something or, or claim ownership to that which when there is a tradition of it being homesteaded by a million people or thousands of people by the state it's been a public property you know like kind of like hey, i i well, have to say i take issue with the from? term public property because uh, it's I, not for lack of a better term it's been used by it's communal property. Communal property. It is, is communal. There should but, be, is there... But it would no longer be communal property. But can somebody own it? How do they... Estate? You know what I mean? I think that's a real question. I think the, you know... Because at some because point, I think we should get some... Think of every person has like... like here a, to, I think the only real question is, I'm, is how do you define, you know, property? I think that's a real good question. Is, well, how would it have been defined before... The government owned that area. No, think of how 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 would that have been homesteaded before the government said this is mine? Well, as Joe said, it would it was state of nature all over again. Like no, was, I'm not talking about. I, I'm talking about a specific situation where this particular piece of land has been this national park. But it is no longer. But if it has no been utilized it, by 
tens of thousands of people on a regular basis. Say all of a sudden this is anarchy and then there's a park down the street. There is where, three of them. Okay, where people go bike riding, <laughs> jogging, walking every single day. And then somebody goes in there and says, well, I'm building a house right here. I got my tidy house. This is my land. Get the fuck off. No. Think of this. You have to go buy a park pass for that thing, right? You have to, yeah. Or, or you have to pay the land. I'm saying basis. even if there's a tradition of, of use of that land. Right. But you have this space. But tradition and, is stupid. And the argumentum ad antiquitatum, uh, right? It's a logical fallacy because we've always done it that way. But parks, people enjoy state of nature. People tend to enjoy it. They like untouched, pristine nature, right? There is a value in that. There is a market demand. Somebody could go in there and border that place and say, here, this is your beautiful park. I'm going to maintain this bike path on here or this walking path. Here's a beach. Um, you can rent canoes here, right? You pay to get in there now. You pay for the privilege of using it in its current state why could not a private owner do the exact same thing uh, right now? It just happens. That's not my point. My point is, how do you establish something like that when it already has an established usage of people? Say, say no, but say, say, okay, we've been living wow. without government for fifty years, and people have been going using this piece of land for recreation, and everybody's been happy. There's been people hunting there, bike riding, every, on a day day by day basis. It sounds like they've established ownership. No, I'm saying, yeah, but 100,000 people or, or random people just use it all the time and say, I use it regularly once a year, or this Danny goes there seven times a year, or somebody else goes there every once in a while, somebody goes there every day. So it's got an established base of Consumers. many different people that don't aren't really claiming ownership, but maybe they go in there and clean up the garbage. or They are claiming down. ownership. It's a very diverse ownership. But I'm, I'm just saying they're... they're there probably is going to need to be some sort of a concept for something like that. You there know, is like a precedent lands. for that already in our current system. If you have a piece of forest that you own and the public regularly goes through your forest and follows a certain path through it, um, it's recognized. And this comes up from laws that are ancient from before the United States even came about. Those people will have an easement across right. their yeah, property. I'm not even talking about they, an easement. I'm talking about like a whole no, I'm saying, area. I'm using this as an example. The point is, they would have the ability to use your forest long into the future because they have always used it in the past. They've homesteaded your forest over hundreds of years. That's and kind of what I'd say. It is. Um, there needs to be some sort of a so this would be a way a, to homestead for public use. In yeah, a way. there are. For large of areas of public property, for example, the tuna fishery before the government took it over, Fisheries. used to work yeah, quite well. Confusing. And then, um, I don't know exactly how it worked, though. I should well, look the this status up. quota system um, basically ended up with <laughs> where they depleted fish populations mm -hmm. because they created an artificial, um, um, basically an, an ugly incentive, an artificial incentive to for everybody to, to grab what they could while they could as opposed to the community, a sort of common law solution that developed naturally where, where people would strike a balance where there would be a, a sort of ostracism and, and social scoring for those who overclaimed, you know, their share of the fish. Um, this is... It was an, cod. It might have been cod. Well, it, off actually, the New England coast, there was a big it, giant true. fishery that was depleted the moment the government started managing it, Absolutely. like 150 years ago or something. Yeah, and this is true um, of both oceanic, um, you know, fisheries and, of course, inland, yeah. where where it's a much more defined and limited thing. But um, yeah, the moment that you have that 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 forced intervention into the market, yeah. everybody starts to try to grab as much as they can before. It's the tragedy of the commons, obviously. Well, was, but before the government created these commons, there was like a, an association kind of. An emergent, the lived around. Yeah, there was an emergent order that happened absent the force of the state that managed that fishery even though none of the um, none of the fisher people actually were like the individual owner of the land. Like you think of like you have to fence off um, And the reason land. is very simple. All of the people who live there and, and who depend upon that space for their, for their sustenance, for their income 
they really don't want to fuck it up. They want to preserve it. They want it to be uh, thriving. It's it's they become kind of, for lack of a better term, part of that Lion King type circle of life. They want it to keep going, right? They want to take what they can without negatively impacting it to the point of, of, of unrecoverable damage. Yeah. Well, well I was going to say is that uh, as an experience is that I. You guys know I disc golf. But the disc golf courses around us aren't really well maintained in the context that, like, people can pretty much traverse through them without much, like, interference from the state or anything like that. So what, end up, what ends up happening, what I notice on these courses, is the people who actually kind of play true to the sport, they develop a certain etiquette amongst other players in which they'll clean up if they see something, they'll tend to clean it up. If Now, the people who are very casual, who just kind of, like, go through it one day and don't do it again, they'll toss their shit all over the place. But the people who play through it continually, um, they'll go in, they'll see it, it's dirty, they'll pick up, they'll contribute to, like, maybe a small fund to help uh, maintain the grass. And so far, it's worked out very well within um, the courses I've played in. Yeah. They feel a sense of ownership to it. Even yeah. though they know they don't own it. They feel a sense of it's ownership basically the to market it. Ever. They have, yeah. Whereas a visitor to it, he doesn't see it in the same light. I remember they have a positive exactly. incentive to the preservation of, of that value that they find in the property. There you go. Right. I, I, remember reading, I remember reading this article um, a few years ago. I wonder if I'll be able to find it for the show notes. I don't know. But um, this um, economist basically wrote that the trip... The tragedy of the <laughs> the tragedy of the commons isn't a real thing until the government comes in and creates incentives for that to happen. Because what normally happens in a commons situation is one of these um, association type things tends to evolve and it tends to get managed quite well. There's and if you look at the entire continent of the of uh, North America, it was managed as a commons before. Um, the Europeans came here. Um, maybe there were separate commonses that were. Are you saying we should have private property? Um, He's saying kill Whitey. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm Joel, saying that there are. There... changed that he's an anarcho <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm saying there is stout, room. Dude. Yeah, there, he there... definitely went Justin Stout on this. <laughs> I'm saying there's room for commons within an anarchist society. I'm going to go ahead and cut in right here with some clips from Eleanor Ostrom's Nobel Prize lecture on managing common pool resources. Understanding the management of common pool resources is an important part of understanding how a free society can operate without the top-down control of the government over these types of resources, which is mostly what we have today. Um, I'm going to put a clip from her lecture. The lecture is about an hour long. I'll put a link in the show notes if you want to watch the whole thing. I highly recommend you either watch the lecture or at least check out some of her work because this is a very important um, factor or topic inside the Liberty community and it's relatively new information. That's why she has a Nobel Prize on this um, on the work that she did in this um, area of study. So here's Eleanor Ostrom. We really demonstrated that complexity is not the same as chaos. If I pull out fish uh, from a lake, that those fish aren't available for anyone else. And it's also the problem of excluding. That with the public good, there's a problem of excluding beneficiaries. Forests, water systems, fisheries, and the global atmosphere are all common pool resources. The number of diverse public goods that exist that range all the way from a small neighborhood to the globe are immense. It turns out that some of us assign Garrett Hardin's tragedy of the commons to our undergraduate students. In some universities, it's assigned three times. And Garrett Hardin had the sense that Gee, you know, people using a pasture or a lake or something, they're helplessly trapped into trying to get as much as they can for themselves. The solution was to turn to other individuals 
somehow these other individuals are pretty different. They can solve it because they're officials or the officials ask us to solve it sometimes. And government ownership or private property is presumed to be optimal and there are times it is. But it's also the case that people self-organize common property institutions of a wide diversity of kind and sometimes solve problems very well. And we began to accumulate and show that they were not trapped. We found of the irrigation systems all over the world, 72% of the farmer managed systems had high performance. The agency managed, the ones that had Asian Development Bank, USAID funding to come in and build very strong, fancy engineered works, only 42% of them were highly efficient. Uh, we found informal fishery groups that allocated benefits. Um, we found all sorts of patterns out there in the world. But we did find that groups that did not communicate were more likely to overuse their resources. So if they didn't know one another, didn't communicate, they'd go in and grab, like what theory predicted. We found that some people had access rights, uh, withdrawal rights, management, exclusion, and, and alienation. And we found a mixture of these five rights that frequently worked very well, not just one. We found a very large number of rules. We began to recognize that there were underlying uniformities, even though they weren't specific rules. And I called them at the time design principles that appeared to be there of the systems that were successful for a long period of time. The users do have some rights to making their own rules. This is really important. Uh, the users themselves can monitor one another or hire their own monitor. And they used graduated sanctions. They also had conflict resolution mechanisms. And of course, you can understand that. Somebody starts to sanction somebody and they say, I'm innocent. And you have conflict. You've got to have a way of uh, getting that resolved. Yeah, yeah, one question I've had, though, is for whatever of observation is that you know, I would say, if we want to use terminology, we're probably here, would consider ourselves mark, free market anarchists or anarchists. anarcho capitalists. Yeah. But if there is no government, it doesn't mean that our ideas are going to rule. You know what I mean? I mean, um, our rules may not be the, the general rule. There may be anarcho primitives. They fuck you. When we call them thing. Native Americans. I, I know <laughs> I'm new, but I, I like to think of it this way: government Trump. is is a more of a, a, a character trait, more of something that that occurs, right? As opposed to the state, which is associated with statism, the the domination through force, right? This is a, um, government is is sort of a, an essence of control. I, it's an internal character trait. I you know David Friedman's view on this, aren't you? Or no? Well, yeah. I'm not full. David Friedman has some very insightful things about him, and in this aspect, he's, I think he separates the government from the state. This is where I'm I, I believe. Yeah, I, I prefer. To separate, but all right. No, just go on. You, you get into a little bit of linguistics here, yes. you know, semantics. So for the duration of this, you're going to separate the two. Government's not wrong as long as it's voluntary. Yeah. I, I believe that government is good and necessary um, so long as it's not forcefully imposed from an external party. Well, that's kind yeah. of contradictory because you you have to figure out who the external party is. Well, the, the issue I is this, the definition of government has right. kind of shifted right. as the state has taken over government. That's That's... What he's getting oh, at. Me, sometimes I use the term both ways. Sometimes I use the government to mean the state. Sometimes I will separate it out. Um, the problem is when you talk to your average status, you say state, they think Michigan, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the government's well, a much better term for talking to most people. Yeah, because they view the government as the state, the way we view the word the state. So I'll use it to mean that. But, but you're, you're using it differently. So even, even definitions can... We can't roll... The definitions, I mean, if there's no government or whatever, or 
Who says your definition is right? Well, that's <laughs> the way it is now. Right. Anyway, the government well, doesn't control. Let me bring up an but ex- no, it putting forth any argument, the first step is establishing term definitions Grammar. and agree upon. Okay, so exactly. going yeah. back to my little hobby of disc golfing, there is we we have the um, professional disc golf association, which is the P D G A. It's kind of like any other type of sports association. You have kind of a governing body. You don't have to participate in it. You don't have to respect the rules of it. Um, but if you want to be part of it, you do, you do have to engage. It's socially acceptable to participate, not socially acceptable to not participate. Is what you're saying? No, no, you're no, saying no, it's voluntary. No. I, it's voluntary because none of us, we don't have to participate. We don't have to obey the rules of what they say. But most of us do because we want to kind of stay true to the sport. Um, I don't have to wear pants right now, but I am. Because yeah. No, you would have to wear pants in my house. <laughs> Probably would, yeah. yeah. This, isn't, this is a dictatorship under this... No pun intended. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, my God. But no, there, there are voluntary associations. Unless we there feel. was no one else here, then you would not be allowed to wear pants. But social acceptance... Is a a positive incentive that it's um, yeah. there's a value in it. We no are one wants to be left out. We we don't want to um, yeah we want to be accepted by those around us, especially those who have common interests such as disc golf. Right, right. If you piss off everybody else who plays disc golf, you're not going to feel good Nobody when you're playing on the course <laughs> and they're all scowling at you and throwing their discs at the side of your head. Yeah, right? yeah. Those hit at eighty miles an hour, so. <laughs> And it's like a pound. <laughs> you put blades in them things, it'd be like what? no people get people bleeding. You've never seen the fucking uh, blades. It sounds wild, like Tron. Wild West. Yeah, I think that like would Tron, be a hell yeah. of a weapon. <laughs> that would be a hell of a weapon. <laughs> fucking disc with a little Discus. blades that pop out. Well, I yeah, thought about if you're uh, like blade. crawl. I thought about yeah, you could have like a remote on it and have the blades <laughs> pop out. I thought about designing a disc that was like military grade, so like when it hit something, it blew up. I, um, my, I think that my ultimate like fun. My ultimate weapon would be like poison tip darts. If you, you can just if you can like houses, keep them like right here in your wrist. If you got really good at darts, oh, no. carry poison tip darts around, and, and that would be like the ult- one of the ultimate ways. To Thank you, events. peaceful anarchist. <laughs> why, why would you join? Uh, why would you join this group if you didn't want? I mean, voluntary or not, <clears throat> whether you you. Could or or didn't have to join, uh, obey the rules. Why would you join the society if you didn't if you didn't want to obey the rules and and be as the others are? Why would you? To co-opt it. Um, I mean, I don't see what the so point would be. We have a natural desire to belong, right? And that's yeah. true. I understand that. That is uh, true. That's social that's animals, going with it. but they share common interests. They are disc golfers. He enjoys disc golf. These other people also enjoy disc golf. How can we all enjoy disc golf without fucking up anybody else's experience performing the same a- activity, right? Right. There's etiquettes. Yeah. There's, there's, like, there's, there's rules and there's some etiquettes. Like, if you're a smaller group, you should be able to pass in front of, like, a much larger group. So well, and that's regular golf. Regular golf. Regular golf. Yeah. Yeah. May I play through? Like um, right. You know. Hmm. While while you're shouting at your hooker girlfriend and puking into the, the, the rough, <laughs> may I? Your wife might be listening to yeah. this. Your wife might be listening to this, by the way, Joe. <laughs> she he just saw that. Not listen to this. <laughs> okay, well, okay, you can talk he about your hooker girlfriend. You can focus on the weekends. <laughs> oh. I love my wife. She, <laughs> she she has no interest in in my activities in this regard. So, okay, as you were saying. But yeah, um, it, there is a desire that arrives out of a natural common interest um, in that activity using that space. Um, and organically, there's going to develop um, a, a, a manner of etiquette, a, a common law, if sure. you will. Right? This is how we can all utilize this space for this activity without negatively impacting others. And it is the market at work. Absolutely. That's kind of like my faith, my religion order. is the market. I, I have faith in the market. I think. Now, I do you also extent. have evidence to support. I was going to say, I have your, a problem with there. There is, there is well, in a way, there's no, no real way to, to say what's going to happen. <laughs> I, but I define faith 
it, in, it, biblically, it, it would agree as is belief in the absence of or in contradiction to actual reason and evidence. Right. Yeah. Well, my reason not, and evidence shows me that the market would work, but that's not faith. But 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 that's a reason. But yeah. you well, really don't know what the it, fuck's going to happen. It's both reason no, and well, no. it's empirical. No, but what I think what he's getting at is that there are certain situations that we have not really seen that have been privatized fully. Oh, yeah. Um, roads typically have not really been privatized unless it's like a really small scale. Well, let's hold up there. Yeah. Roads have they started out not been privatized for, uh, what, a little over 100 years. Prior to that time... They were there was no such thing as a government road other than mm. the post. Um, they they which were they would. But I, I guess what I'm getting at is more of like a modern context. Like the roads you're talking about, like in New York City from you know the 1900s, early 1900s, late 1800s, like cobblestone dirt roads. You're talking about the Eisenhower well, interstate. Yeah, I'm talking yeah, more like the <laughs> highway system. We've not seen that in a private sense, except. Semi the Ohio Turnpike. No, well, the well, Ohio there's a lot of turnpikes. So they, it's they the do. Indiana one, but in Europe there are private um, turnpikes all over the place. Oh yeah, and really, unless yeah. we should forget, oh, the Eisenhower Interstate the System company, was funded entirely yeah. on debt, and uh, which rent, has never like been so. repaid, and it was designed specifically to facilitate troop movements in the event of, of a full on nuclear. That's a myth, really? actually. Oh. The, the interstate system? Yeah. Yes. The design, that was a myth that, okay, so when they were designing it, that was one of the suggestions for it, but it wasn't necessarily the reason to develop it. They thought that they could land, like, air, uh, not aircraft carriers, um, airplanes. Airplanes on it. And they can. Yeah. It's been proven. <laughs> well, no. If you look at M59, you couldn't land a jet on that. Every five miles, well, there's at least, what, what is it, one full straight mile? Um on every stretch of interstate? I didn't know that. Yeah. It's... No? Our producer's disagreeing with us. <laughs> <laughs> producer Dave is shaking He his says head. no. Why do you say no, Dave? The interstate was designed... Was, they used the uh, defense argument as, a, as an excuse to get funding for it. It wasn't necessarily... It's reasonable. Realistic. Being. Realistic. And in areas where it's extremely hilly, you can't pull it straight away. But, but even, yeah. even so... To try to say, well, this is why these everybody did this. Right. There's a lot of reasons for everything, and, and you know, it's like the Supreme Court saying, well, the original intent was this. How the fuck do you know what somebody was thinking 200 years ago? How do you, how That'd do you know what, they told what excuses they, they sold right. us on? Well, they wrote down what they wanted you to hear. Every well, person, yeah, right. that's what I mean. There's a lot of different reasons for everything. So that's all. No, I, I, I was, Dave was right. That's how I read the whole argument for the interstate system was. And again, going back to M59, it's it's hilly, it curves. You can't... Uh, yeah, it may be five miles apart, but... But it's an M, it's not an interstate. It's... Yeah. <laughs> Fucking damn you, Mike. <laughs> it's true, it's not an interstate. <laughs> it's a mini interstate. Well, it's oh, is that what the M was? It's I thought it was from Michigan. Highway, yeah. But it's not part of the inter- <laughs> interstate it system. Right. But it's, it's an interstate. That, that interstate <laughs> system that... Um, Try landing a plane on M... I-75 near Detroit. Even- You'll crash into shit ton of shit. <laughs> <laughs> There's no reason to assume. Now, that's current use like 50 years later, right? But when these things were designed, they they one of the motivations, one of the selling points was to facilitate troop movements. Troop movements. Right? That's um, what they sold them for. Yeah, that was one of that's the how they sold points. it. That's how they sold it. And, of course, whether it be for that actual purpose or whether it be um, a make-work yeah. scheme... I think that would have stopped. Mark? Yeah, I heard people. Sufficient space on car. Oh, what? Oh, really? My car is full. What's up? Mine's still going. Mine's probably still going. I'm not good at this, but I can't read. No, that's it. (laughs) But I can't read. (laughs) You fucked up, Joe. How is it? It should be able to hold two full episodes. Well, when's the last time you cleared it out? Three episodes. (laughs) No, there's only one one episode on it. How long was the so episode? Was space on it was cars. from last Okay, come on. Everybody scoot over. we got to get on that side of the couch. <laughs> <laughs> well, i got to reload my you're, beer. You're in the main camera. Oh, Actually, yeah, the beer. All right, okay. Time out. Break. No, no, no. So I know we kind of went off on a tangent when we were talking about the tiny houses being seized by the LAPD, right? We did. Now, yes, we did. One of the things 
we were kind of discussing is um, you have all these people willing to build and donate these tiny houses to the homeless, right? Which, uh, for better or for worse, uh, regardless of the reason, people who do not produce sufficient value um, to exchange with others to purchase their own homes, right? P- right. These are, this is a charitable donation, right? Bums. Now, yes. you, have, <laughs> you have this effort to provide these tiny houses to all of these bums. Somebody has sufficient resources to build these things, right, yeah. and to give them to them. They're getting donations. Why do they not have a plot of land, of even if it's a campground of something, of vacant land, where they can place these tiny houses, where where the bums can live in them? Um, so you know. what are they doing? They're putting these on so-called people are sticking lands. them under bridges. Really? And, yeah. On no, the side, that's just they're parking them in parking spots on the side of the road. That's yeah, just goofy. So, so you can, on that level, you can understand why the government would take them. Well, yeah, and, I mean, you don't <laughs> necessarily have to be a bum. I mean, even in the absence I don't, of state, it's probably pretty cool if I yeah. had like a little tiny house and I could get like rent free. You know, hey, I can buy this house for or whatever. Give me a house and I'll right. throw it on the side of the road. Even in the absence of statism, I living where I live would prefer not to have. Um, vagrants in donated tiny houses living along the side of my streets. It, it is an undesirable condition. Well, you're for a racist. <laughs> I, I don't think homelessness is a race <laughs> thing. <laughs> what if there were white people living in those tiny houses? Would that well, bother no, you? What, even what, the you same? Are, what you are, Joe, is you're a capitalist <laughs> and you hate the poor. Just like the rest of us. You're a Honestly, you're a I would say you're inequality. This. I have no is enemies in Trump? people. I have enemies in bad ideas. It doesn't matter. It's Absent the bad ideas, in every person I find another friend. Right, and in that many cases, so the poor <laughs> are in He's fact poor because of the manifestation of of a great many bad ideas layered on top of one another. Bad decisions and bad decisions. Yeah. Bad ideas. Bad decisions lead inevitably to bad decisions. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean now. Bad the, luck could be part of it. To that end, I would say yeah. voluntary Good poverty, drugs. right? Self-induced poverty. I detest it. I, I abhor it. I think it's. I think it's wretched. And now, if somebody chooses if to live voluntary, voluntary, like look at the way. Um, look at the ad proofs. I don't like it at all. What? Look at the ad no, I, I was talking about. I was thinking of like Jason and Mary. They they have chosen a life. And I love poverty. Jason and Mary. And they're very happy with. Now, of course, they're not homeless. They they found a roof to put over their heads, um, sort of. And, um, but, but, I mean, it's dry. Life can be very difficult. Now, Jason and, and, and Mary have chosen that life. Our hippies, they have, for, they've chosen their life, but they have never inflicted the consequences of it no. on anybody else not. at all. Um, and in fact, they have created beautiful, um, Amazing art for us. Uh, yeah. I watched Jason carve this lizard rock, breathing stone dust to his own detriment. That my daughter still keeps under her bed years later in the doors. It's wonderful. And By I would hear that, that yeah. video of your daughter dancing was one of the most adorable <laughs> things I've ever seen. That is, I, she I is such a good dancer. Something really fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> I really thought you were going to say something really fucked up. God. No, I. Uh, oh, so for I guess benefit of the audience, I have a six-year-old girl, and she is uh, disgustingly cute. Be- the daddy-daughter dance video of her <laughs> dancing that was just so adorable. <laughs> that was cool. That was really yeah. cool. So I, 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 so it's probably not just intentional poverty that you're bothered by. Perhaps it's a certain type of intentional poverty. I would say it's it's when um, laziness. Not so much laziness because. I myself appreciate laziness. I like to be a lazy motherfucker. Like, I, I love a good day when I sit around and um, spend an entire lonely Sunday, like, playing with myself, watching Netflix, <laughs> eating ice cream. I mean, this is... Laziness has its wonderful Everybody's got to have a hobby. Exactly. <laughs> but it's when you Why, inflict important. the consequences <laughs> of your choices you upon <laughs> others <laughs> wait, wait, he's got something here. through involuntary measures it's when I decide to be lazy and I make other people suffer for it without any regard for their will yeah that's when it becomes a problem yes um, so you're you're violating the non-aggression principle or with by, your own if by I, using other people's property for your own uses without well, permission if I choose yeah. not to produce value to trade with others and, and live in poverty, that is my choice. 
But if I force through any measure, whether it be through um, state means, whether it be myself holding a gun and saying, give me your wallet, it doesn't matter. It's, it's as soon as I force others to bear the consequences of my chosen actions, that's I when it's a problem. I don't care what you do as long as, you well, know, I don't care if you, yeah, like, it, I don't care what you, I, I, I once told James, our friend, at, at, uh, you know, I think if you don't work, you should die. Not that you should die or that anybody should kill you, well, but it, but it's not my responsibility to support you. Let's I face it, nature's going to pretty much do that job on her own if you don't work. Yeah, that, that's what he's getting at. <laughs> well, uh, the problem is, is that government is fucking always perverts nature. That's, well, I wanted to ask. You could, well, and there's a lot the of safety nets out nature. there now, too, so you don't really have to take care of yourself. These so, are the safety nets pervert you, nature. Artificial you, market um, incentives that create perverse incentives. Right. Well, right? You could say that squatting is a type of theft. Because yeah, you're stealing the use of someone else's property. You know, and it gets complicated when it's so-called public land, so it does get complicated, yeah. but... We say squatting, right? But you talk about some of these homes in Detroit where they have been absolutely vacant for decades, and yeah, nobody no. has made any attempt at any sort of assertion of ownership or made any effort to improve the property or say, hey, this is my space, right? So you might decide to not define that as squatting and decide to define that as homesteading. Well, after a certain still amount of time... you calling it squatting because theoretically somebody on paper owns it, but maybe in a free society they wouldn't be squatting. Well, it would be homesteading. Right now, those records of who owns what is, is entirely defined by by the state, by well, their records. Now, Well, I would imagine even in, a ca- in in Kapistan, there would be records of who owns title of the... Of well, the title company is handled this very well now. It's, it's not even necessarily run by the government. Title insurance? But after yeah. a certain you know, no. point, uh, that house has been taken away from it them due to lack of... to a state of nature. Exactly. Uh, funny, uh, At some point, you only uh, own it. Interesting. In state, uh, uh, I think it's in Michigan. You only own it for three years if you don't pay the taxes. Abandoned. It they is. take it from you. It it is. So years. at that point, it, it is reverted back Damn. to a state of nature. Was, so. Abandonment is, is a, of, of property is a mm-hmm. real thing. Now, if you're like an ANCOM, that means like three minutes. Now... In the state of Michigan, it's three years. <laughs> in in Kavistan, who knows? It, it may vary from area to area because, you know, uh, let, you might have a vacation home that you don't visit for you know, five I, years. I've um, heard the argument where you can only own property that you can defend in a way that's not really untrue. What if your property can defend itself? Well, then you can exactly. own That's cool. Sentry <laughs> guns, aliens. So it's automated defense. My dog. No, you well, could delegate. Um, that's called uh, geography. I mean, you know, that's why you, you know, if you got a you castle on top defenses. of a mountain, that's very defensive. Well, and, and let's face it, property is, in general, is a social concept, right? A no. man who lives on an island by himself has no purpose for property because there's nobody who can possibly overturn challenge his it. claim or challenge his claim. Well, he owns the entire island. Well, he doesn't actually own it. He doesn't need to own it because... He's it's just him. Well, he's, he's, he's there. He's, he's, gonna he's, there. There. he's gonna operate in the capacity yeah. that it, that he does own it. Yeah, because he's gonna yeah, pick what the if person shows up. Yeah, the moment well, somebody else shows up on this island. He's gonna demonstrate what we would define as um, characteristics of ownership, but in the absence of any sort of contention or possible contention, uh, he doesn't actually really need to own it. But what? I don't give a shit. If I'm here and there's nobody else, if I'm the last man standing, I don't need to say that I own anything. I'll just do whatever the fuck I want, and it doesn't matter. Nobody I can possibly contest it. Kind of like Robinson Crusoe, the, that whole thing. Yeah, we drove through Detroit on the way here. Wendy's from uh, Kalamazoo, and she drove with me from south of Detroit to here. We went through downtown. Ew. And I was like, she was like, <laughs> she was like looking at like the houses, concrete. and I go, well, just look, you know. I point, so she starts watching all the houses as we're driving Did down. Did you I get off of the car? You're on the freeway. Yeah. You know, I go. I wish we had more time because we were running late. Although it wouldn't have mattered. I'd take you through some of these. Yeah, it's amazing it's when you insane. get off. But but you can see a lot from the freeway. And then all of a sudden, she's like, oh, this neighborhood's. Like, you know, this neighborhood looks like a lot better. I go, yeah, we're probably getting close to 8 Mile, you know. <laughs> and I look at the next exit's 9 Mile. I go, oh, no, that was, we're in Warren now. Right. Which is, you're in Warren. Yeah, it was amazing, the, the difference. The difference was there was, like, 
There was all yeah, you could all see it, houses with no windows. Shells. So they were they were literally shells. And then you would see a burned out house, and then it was shell, shell, burned out house, shell, shell, burned and then out all house. Of a sudden, nice and then neighbor. all of a sudden, there was uh, there was cars parked in front of houses. Green houses grass. Had, you know, I mean, and yeah, you could see grass. I pointed and, out to her. I go, this neighborhood was probably built. At the same exact within you couldn't same see exact where one time. ended they and the other the same, one began. Yeah. The same exact type of neighborhood, same builders, might have well, been built in the same year. The thing with Detroit and those housing is that if if you pay attention to Detroit's expansion outward, uh, and they've been trying to actually incorporate, if I recall correctly, they've been trying to incorporate Roseville and uh, Warren into their tax district. That would be horrible. Harper Woods as well. No, yeah. nobody's going to let them. Do but, it. No, they, those communities have been fighting that. Uh, tooth and nail because they know what comes with, with a it. different county. Well, politically, it's not very easy. But the point is, is that Detroit has been trying to garner more revenue by taxing those who live closest to what we would call right? Given which the collapse so, of their existing uh, revenue streams. They've been trying to find ways of, which would, which, of finding new which revenue streams without premise, actually adding any value to my anybody, premise. Right? Is there's two things that have literally, I mean, unbelievably changed the face of the city of Detroit. So before we get to, is, before we get to that, I just I want to tell the audience that I have a video. It's a very rough video, but... Um, <laughs> oh, you're driving down Alter Road? Oh, yeah, driving across Alter Road. This is in a more extreme contrast area than what he's talking about. He's talking about crossing Detroit into Warren. It's a pretty extreme contrast. Which, which is a lower-income community uh, in the suburbs. But um, I crossed from Detroit into Gross Point Park. Oh, God. Um, yeah. Across oh, wow. Alter Road, and I drove up and down some of the side streets, and the video was like maybe 15 minutes long. I do... Um, two crossings in each direction in the video and it's just me by myself in my car so it's not the best quality video but it shows you what we're talking about it's like crossing the Rio Grande and it's, just, just I mean, look on Google Earth and, and just yeah. look at the you can tell the where the color city change. You can I, I do landscaping yeah. I can tell by your lawn and your, your bushes and your trees you know, you can you can blindfold me and drop me off, and I can pretty much say we are in Detroit or you, not in Detroit. Detroit, this particular area is so bad that you could easily raise cattle in this part of Detroit because so many houses have been torn down. I don't know if you so, could easily raise. Them. You could easily raise cattle. So anyway, oh, that's all lead, dude. Back to uh, <laughs> there, there's two. Anyway, two I'll things. post a link to the video it's in the not show notes. Be organic. <laughs> no. there are, Your grass there, bed's not going to be organic. There are two One person things. at a time. Urban farms have a kind of problem. Yeah. There's two things. Uh, Detroit's right for urban farming. There's two things uh, that have changed the face of Detroit, and one is Dutch elm disease. And when I was a child, white people. <laughs> They came all Whatever. across the suburbs too, though it, it wasn't just no, Detroit. No, I've, Sorry, we're here. It to changed start. the whole country. But literally, <laughs> when I was a child, you could drive down streets in Detroit, and it was like a cave because the way the branch form of Dutch elms it was gigantic old growth. Yeah, yeah. that's but not just the Detroit, whole, though. That uh, was all the suburbs I'm too. Just, it's a minor point. That Dave. doesn't. I could be done with it by now. Let me finish right. talking. But I'm just saying, the face of Detroit was totally changed by Dutch elm disease. These Dutch trees elm. just. You would just drive down every street in the city of Detroit. I've talked to older people about this, and that's the city of Detroit was just amazing because all the streets had these, you know, 50, 100 foot, 100 something foot Dutch elms, and it was just like a cave because of the branch structure. That has that totally changed the face. It was amazing. It also changed the face of Allen Park, though. It has nothing to do with this topic. Those are also known as. Would you uh, let me finish talking? <laughs> it changed, and it. Those if are you also let me known talk, as Cottonwoods, can, right? No, no, not no. at all. No, Dutch elms are, you don't see them too often. They are still the or American elms are the Dutch elm disease kills. Yes. But regardless, it totally changed the look of Detroit. And Detroit is being the main older part of the... Detroit had all of their street trees were Dutch elms. So it changed Detroit more than anywhere else. Although From it changed an artistic a lot of point them. of view. From just a, a visual point of view, if you were driving down... The city would look totally different right now. That's one thing. The other thing is... So the absence of old growth trees lining the streets. What you're saying well, now... The beauty of it. I think yeah. the yeah. absence yeah. of the beauty of it. No, it, literally, when you drove down any side street, it, like. it was like a cave. 
You don't really know. I, I'm not not to be condescending. You don't really know because Dutch, the way they, it was a perfect circle, the way the branch structure no, is. I, I do know. I, I went to school and I grew up going to school in Gross Point Woods. I, I know no, these, but the, these the, the trees, the, this effect. The structure is different is what I'm saying. But it, it's it's really a, a minor point. No, it's the structure in of Gross Dutch Point, Elms. they treated the elm trees and they didn't die. They're well, still there. No, they're not. But whatever. That's a side point. <laughs> I guess wish you guys would let me talk. You're going to make me lose my train of thought. There so are two the things the that change right the look <laughs> of the city of Detroit. One is Dutch elm disease, and the other one is the income tax. That is my point. If you go drive through Detroit, it looks most of your lower class neighborhoods, which is about 95% of Detroit or whatever, are just decimated. They're, you know, there's vacant land everywhere, vacant houses everywhere, bombed out houses everywhere. Blight. And blight, like you've never seen. If you've never been to Detroit, you've never really seen it anywhere else. I don't think it exists no. anywhere else. Pontiac. But, okay, Flint. whatever. Pontiac and Flint. It might point exactly, which are microcosms of Detroit. I don't know. Or I mean, St. Louis. Um, I don't. DC. I, I I don't really know, but I don't think any place has it on the scale well, of Detroit. You see, Detroit is. It, it's physically larger. But it, it is physically larger in terms of real estate, and it is uniquely dependent on on um, manufacturing of automobiles. I think it's more so, to do. Would you let me finish my point? It has okay. more to do with the Still income not. tax than anything, and the reason is is we drove from Detroit. It went to Warren, a, a very, you know, M&M's hometown, whatever, a very low-class, poor It's poor area. suburbs. But mm, barely. it's... I was going to say it was the income, working class. You know, so it's yeah. a very... It's a, a, a lower-income area. That's where all the auto with, as soon as you cross, it's clean. As soon as you cross 8 Mile, all the houses are not vacant. Shibbles. You know, they're not noticeably was, vacant. Whatever, yeah. It was clean there. Yeah, so all the houses were halfway decent, whatever. So the, but the, my point is, is that surrounding the suburbs, surrounding Detroit, are not that bad. And never really got that bad. The other, there well, were. Well, that's because Detroit's never expanded its tax grip, and that's no. What I was the thing is, earlier. is the thing is, is you know everybody associates white flight with the the riots in nineteen sixty seven riots, and then white people left in droves. And then middle class black people also left, and but it's I think, well, you know maybe it's part of it is the riots and you know crime and racism is definitely no no small part, but the the one main thing that that kept it going is the income tax because why would you live in a city and property taxes you know Detroit for what you're getting you know you're you know the, the property tax rate is. The income, Super high, and then the income tax is, you know, on top of that, another 5%. So why would anybody who makes any kind of money want to live in the city of Detroit when they can move a few miles away to Gross Point or whatever well, and not lose their investment? The income tax, though, is, I mean, in terms of everything that happens, it's, it's a relatively small percentage. It's just one piece of the well, puzzle. Well, it depends on how it's you look at it. It's the piece of the puzzle that took Detroit... You know, well, there's it, much it, more. There's, there's no much reason more to the puzzle than that. It's it's a, say, there is no multi- reason. There is no reason. The main reason that you would live, you would move a mile north, a quarter mile more north to Warren from Detroit, is the income tax. It's, it's not just that. Actually, there's there's a there's a more. whole bunch of reasons there's why. A lot of reasons, but that is the, the let me finish the my turn. Tipping, <laughs> <the> tipping. Um, <laughs> Well, we're gonna have a crossfire episode. Yeah, um, <laughs> <what> people's <laughs> elbow. Yeah. No, there, there's a lot stuff. more to the story, and these other things are important. Um, I'm not saying they're not important. You're gonna be let me listen to say what they are. There's um, a lot more. There's a lot more, and a lot of it has to do with the government, and it's not just the taxes. The government has created this huge bureaucracy Regulatory. in the city of Detroit that gets in the way of doing 
anything that you want to do with exactly. a piece of property in Detroit. Everything requires e- a permit. Everything requires Approval. a permit. $350 a year Hand to own jobs. a house you don't live in. Yeah. And they, and the, the, it's for an inspection, and they don't even come out and do the inspection. You just have to pay the money. Um, Detroit's uh, actually my, my, uh, harder to deal so with in the suburbs for getting permits. They, they do not respond to people. Detroit has a... Um, a Part of their government is this this team that goes out Council. and shuts down businesses that don't meet, fit the central plan. Um, can I can I add to this? Yeah. Um, for a long time, and as far as I know, up until rather recently, you weren't allowed to have a grocery store within the city of Detroit. Right now, the only one, yeah. The only grocery <laughs> store, yeah. It was, there aren't any. No, there, there is there, one. There's, there's one. Whole Foods. There's a Whole Foods. No, there was a little, the there was a little wow. grocery store. Oh, Whole Foods. There's why, one. Why they, I have this not heard there's, there's what? One on Jefferson. No, no, no. What happened let was. Let Danny finish. I meant What happened this. was all the liquor stores and all no, the. No, why were you not allowed to have a. No, let me tell you. All the liquor stores and all the beer stores and all the convenience stores lobbied the Detroit, the city of Detroit and sat there and said. City Council. We can't allow Myers, Walmart, Kroger's, whatever have you, into our city because you will crush. They will crush us, and we are small businesses. I and this. it actually worked. And yeah. now there's practically no supermarkets except for the one that we would call uh, Whole Foods. And even then, they're not really that big. Of I've actually been in that facility. It's not really that big. There are other grocery stores, they but they're not, small p- footprint grocery yeah, stores. Yeah, they are. More or less downtown with the new center area, but I mean they're more or less. And if you look at the trendy stores, area, they're not really in its political. Immediately surrounding the city borders, they they suffer these consequences. Yeah. Um, yeah. These stores are, are are burned out and and hit up, and they have these excessive security burdens um, because of because of the nature of. Well, what's they have happened. put grocery stores in the city, you know. For political reasons, like, okay, we're going to move back to the city and Eastern and they Market. Don't work out. I mean, no, I mean, like, no, it's really it is it is Eastern Market, and like Whole Foods, and that's well, really the Eastern what it comes down for for the audience at literally home, literally the entire downtown yeah. area. There's, there's there's one grocery store on Jefferson, but no, the whole Detroit, not not. Eastern well, when I, when I downtown, I mean, yeah, I was, 25 okay. miles we drove from the south to the north end of Detroit, right. there's Whole Foods and Eastern Market. And saw yeah, and the Eastern Market for the so audience. And I understand, I understand, mm-hmm. I understand the, 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 if, if these are mom and pop places, I understand well, that's how you have to tell the audience what the Eastern Market is, because they don't know what it is. I have not been to the Eastern so, Market, for the but audience, I know of the Eastern Market, and it's it's basically it's a big open market. It's, it's a the, flea market it's full like, of food. It's right. a it's farmer's, like a farmer's market. market. Yeah. But they're only like I've been trying to get him to take minutes. me to the, to the Eastern Market. But so I it's not a grocery now. store. The Eastern it's a market, market is the main supply for all of the Southeast Michigan uh, restaurants and, and, and grocery stores. It's where everybody brings their their goods to market. It's for, like a farmer's for, market. It is yeah. well, a, we have a gigantic small farmer's market. Farmer's it's, market. A gigantic small it's a massive market. Market. I mean, we have, and it does reside within Detroit. Right. Uh, the wholesalers are there, too, all the meat and mm. Fruit and vegetables. It's where we, we tailgate for Lions games. And, you know. But I don't deny anything you guys are saying about Detroit. My point is that the tipping point with white flight has been the income tax. And that, yes, there are some other very strong reasons the lack of services, the huge amount of crime. But when you incentivize anybody who makes any kind of money to not live in Detroit. So you you are saying, okay, we only want poor people. That's what they did. You do not, if you're going to make, you know, if you're a two-income family making a couple hundred grand a year, and why would you live in the city of Detroit? There's a lot of good reasons to live in Detroit. Detroit's really up and coming. It's a wonderful place to live, but, you know, you're going to have to pay another $10,000 to live there. You're gonna to have to pay another five or ten grand to live there. Why? Why would you not just put that towards a house payment where you can actually get your money back in your house, actually get services? You know, live a few miles outside of the city. You know, everybody. It's not really a, well, what you're seeing is a gentrification of um, like the cities surrounding Detroit, Ferndale, Royal Oak, uh, Warren. You're seeing a lot of like 
Her my words. generation, which are more mostly composed of morons. Uh, <laughs> Sorry for you. You're not yeah, morons. I know. They're like, oh, we can take this house and rebuild it. This It'll be like is. 2008. And, Everybody you know, born from this year to this year is stupid. And, and, no, it just it really bothers me that yeah, there's... from zero to... Uh, Tomorrow. <laughs> they'll, they'll sit there, they'll buy this property, smart. they'll build it up, they'll give it, because they build it up, because they improve upon it, suddenly it commands a higher price, but we all kind of know what the economic game is going on, is that there's just a bubble in housing, and these millennials are going to lose their ass once that bubble pops again. So the whole gentrification thing, that whole, let's move down to Detroit, it's nonsense, it's bullshit. Once that bubble pops, they're all fucked. Oh, that bubble popped about no, 10 no, years no, no, ago. no. Um, There's a new bubble in real estate. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. The real money is pouring no, into Detroit even right in now. The, Detroit is on fire. <laughs> to be honest with you, it's it's just amazing what's going on. Even in the like city. eight years ago, when, when this thing happened, it's it's certain areas. There's a lot of bank-owned properties that were never put onto the market. Of course, those were withheld because to put them out open in the open market would artificially depress all of the property values, which would result in a, a more significant collapse. There's a lot of that, that a lot of those foreclosures that never went out. They're still sitting there. They're chilling, How does this right? work? Though? There's, like a, there's, a, there's a real estate bubble still waiting to happen on top of the student loan bubble, which is Ooh, student loan. inevitable in a very short period of time. It is, but, but, yeah, that's a whole other topic. The yeah. income tax in the city of Detroit, um, as it is in Flint or Pontiac or any of those places, it's a small percentage. But what really, I it's think, what really, I, I think it's part of a problem. But I think what the real problem is, is this regulatory environment that's created. Like oh, he was yeah. saying, you want to do anything in the city of Detroit, you have to give, you know, I, I mean, you want to even think about a business, you have to give eight hand jobs, three blow jobs. Number one, and, number one, if you want to do I anything mean, in the city of Detroit, unless you're downtown or some of the more trendy areas, just go fucking do it because... That's the you good thing. You can go do it, and then the but, local committee comes by but, and shuts your business. But, right. but, but, there's a huge but, but if you want to do something lasting and actually try to do it, and you don't have the knowledge of who to pay off and how to, who's to grease, and, you know, you don't have the inside knowledge, you're going to get, you're not going to have very good luck. Well, you're always, you know, Detroit facing... has always been, you know, I do some construction, and I, no builders and stuff in Detroit has always been the worst place to get a permit. It's yeah. just like you can get shut it's down. It's full time. Well, it's just, just you the bureaucracy know. is retarded. You can't get inspections. It's not like you know you can go to Birmingham or Dearborn and say I need an inspection tomorrow. Or, and you know that Jim Bob is the you know inspector, what? and then if you buy his kids a little tuition, you know you're good to go. Detroit, yeah, you never. Is know. that due to lack of manpower, or is that due to lack of poor management? Sh- corruption yes. inside corruption. the city of Detroit. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I mean, you know, if you have to grease a palm, you have to grease a palm. That's that's one thing. But is that due to the fact that's just you know, it's just it's a corrupt system, or is it due to lack well, of? I mean, you say system. There's a number of layers to this system, right? And, and all of them. I come from a smaller town, so for me, you know, it's it's. There's not the same. I come from a smaller there's town. There's a tension you know? amongst them, and they act out toward a general paralysis where anybody who wants to actually produce value for other people is number one scared to do so. Number two, subject to seizure and, and uh, yeah, aggression it, at any time for any reason. If which, there's anything good happening in the Detroit, city of Detroit, eventually somebody's going to get in there and fucking suck their claws into it and suck the oh, life out of it. The like city that. council Listening says... Listening to you guys talk, it's no wonder that this that the neighborhoods in the city are empty. Oh, yeah. Or in that city, because yeah, we're not actually in Detroit. No, but yeah. it's, it's, you know, listening to you guys talk, it's it's... It's literally no wonder that the the neighborhoods are empty. There's one. Really, I mean, on top of the fact that you know the, really the obviously cool consequence you know, to all this, the though. jobs, that kind of thing. But you know, unless you want to work at a bar downtown, there's some great bars there. But there are I one of the awesome things, some things that happens. Need a beer. Yes. Okay. One of the awesome things that happens as a result of all this, less than what is it, one third of the city residents actually pay their scheduled property tax. Almost nobody does. Or water bills, or income. Nobody pays income tax. Well, the, the city income tax, a lot of employers pull, 
pull it out, like you look at all of Dan Gilbert, which but, my God, he does uh, more for. I the- just read on the way here when I was googling that the city income tax started in '64. That in 2016, he wasn't this actually year, reading on Google while he was driving. <laughs> whatever, driving so a gigantic anyway, Ford pickup. <laughs> anyway, while waiting Google. <laughs> anyway, the state of Michigan is gonna gonna now start collecting income tax for the city of Detroit, which. Oh, it's bad for yeah. you. Makes sense. Yeah, he did read that. But, but he, you talk about the, the, a third of the people not paying like, property no tax in the city of Detroit. Less than that are um, paying income tax. Less than half. Um, the, the, the problem with that idea is Nobody a, a, lot of, a lot of anarchists have run with this and thought, hey, we could move there and not pay um, property tax. But what, what really happens is that's how many people have abandoned their property, in a sense. Maybe they still live there, but they know that within three years, the government is going to come in and kick them off of their, their the property. The people really don't um, pay their water that, bills. They don't shut the water off no, like they do. That's what's going to happen. I remember the water thing, and <laughs> that part was kind of fucked up. People like, water is a human right. I'm like, yeah, water... I, I will not stop you from going to get water. The river is, is there. Right. And you can go get it. Yeah, but you want to tote it with a bucket. Be, the the be guy gone, yeah. who, you know, builds the pipes and who designs it, who installs them, who pumps the water out, who filters it, who designs who this maintains compensation. It. All of these people. Puts the lead in it. I, <laughs> I, I, do not, a little extra in I do not wish to enslave these people. Right. I think they deserve compensation for their You're efforts. You're a racist. And, and I yeah. value You're what they do. Black lives matter. But part matter. of that yeah. is an entitlement um, attitude that a lot of no. people have. They think they're entitled to water, even it, it, mm. but they're so used to it just coming into the yeah, house. Well, 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 they don't the understand that there are there There's was a, human labor involved in exactly. getting that water into the house. Thank Positive you. rights yeah. are bullshit. And Absolutely. on that note, I think we should wrap up the Wait, show. Wait, one more quickie. All right, we need these two guys' anarchy story. <sighs> Me? What's your story? Okay, so um, a, <clears throat> I have to run for volunteers. Well, Mine, we, we mine's not it. the shortest, but um. I I grew up um, son of a mechanic and a and a housewife, um, but somewhere along the line they decided that I was particularly good at uh, the schooling process, and they sent me You're particularly good at the mat mechanic process. Thank you. Sir. <laughs> they sent me to to a place also- in Gross Point where my parents could not afford to pay the tuition because it was not a government school where we were already paying for it, and. Um, I was as good at taking their test. So I was in this place alongside a, a very different social economic group, right? These these people who were from a different place than I was. Blue collar. Um, no, they yeah. were richer. No, you were blue collar. They were morbidly wealthy. My dad was a mechanic. Um, I, I was nobody. And um, I grew up amongst them. My great grandfather lived in Gross Point Woods, right by my school. He, out of all of my family, was this uniquely talented individual who had made himself a a, a very wealthy man. Um, and I, re- I spent my childhood at his side, watching the stock ticker or watching C-SPAN <laughs> when Congress was in session. He was a staunch Republican. I learned that from him. Um, I was an arch conservative. I Grew up during the Reagan years. Republicanism was my thing. I, um, at some point, developed a certain measure of economic literacy. And um, for a long time, I was diverted toward the Republican end of the spectrum. Um, But I always was one who asked a lot of questions. Why is this... Why do I have to do this? Why are you making me do this? Um, and at some point, I started asking those same fundamental questions of of government. And at that time, I was becoming a young adult. I enjoyed smoking weed, <laughs> which was, of course, illegal. Um, I watched a lot of my friends endure major legal troubles because of substances that they voluntarily chose to peacefully input into their body. Um, it, it was then I found kind of the Ron Paul message, which this is a sort of a, <laughs> a very common story. Mm-hmm. Um, and I watched what happened there. And by the time the 2012 elections came around, I 
abandoned all hope in in forced governance and uh, decided that it was completely immoral and started to pursue more more peaceful measures and more logical, well thought out methods of interacting with my my fellow humans and. That's when the MPLC found me, and I declared myself an anarchist and, and found my new family. So let me see if I understand. I need a high five for that. <laughs> <laughs> Did you declare yourself an anarchist before or after the MPLC found you? You know, before. I, I, I'd say one of the key documents was um, Bastiat's The Law, which, if you if you read that, obviously he's coming from a status perspective. I'll but put a link in the show notes to it. It's on YouTube, and it's also, I'm sure, pretty sure I can find it on PDF. When when you read it, if you if you logically interpret his points, you reach the conclusion of, of anarchism because there's no possible moral method method in which you can impose your will against another human being. Um, it, it took me a bit, and I was a um, not only was I conservative, but I was an arch patriot, nationalist. Wrap myself in the flag, salute, cross your heart, um, sing the national anthem. I mean, I was into it. That was my shit. My dad was a Marine. Um, and now, my dad was a Marine for an interesting reason. It was because he was going to be drafted in the Army, and he didn't fucking want to. <laughs> he, he, that was his own personal way of saying fuck you. He was from a poor farm family, and he knew it was going to happen one way or another. Um even after 9-11 happened, after all of it, he forbade me from ever joining the military, um, which I didn't fully understand at the time, but I like that. now I that. really get it. Yeah. Um, and thank God, because, well, no, I don't believe you do God. You do look like a jarhead. I, I was in the uh, Air Is Force. that a Paul thing? Yes. Oh, fuck. Um... <laughs> that's, a that's a wonderful story, story there, Joe. Huh? That's, good. that's a wonderful story. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. That's the highlight of the, highlight of the, um, of the thing. My story is a little more simple. Um, I was raised uh, by oh, I was raised by a single mom who was raised by a single mom back in the, in the days when single mothers and and that single parents were much more rare weed? than they are today. Um, <laughs> she did smoke. Uh, um, my grandmother, who raised me in my teen years, um, she was very democratic and very vocal about her democratic. I remember, speaking of Reagan, I remember uh, <laughs> during Reagan's State of the Union speeches, my grandmother sitting there, and she would watch for a few minutes, and then she would... And my grandmother... Tear would, down this wall! Oh, my God. She wouldn't say <laughs> shit if she had a mouthful, but as soon as Reagan was on the television, she would start cussing. And she would jump up, and she would run over, and she would, she would, asshole! And she would turn off the TV, and she would go, and she would sit down. And she would get back up, and she would go, and she turned the TV back on. And, of course, you know, this, back then, you didn't, didn't have remotes, you know, so. <laughs> I used she, to have <laughs> I've kind of aged myself there a little bit. And she'd come, and she'd watch it for a few channel. more minutes, and then she would start yelling at the TV again. She'd go, she'd turn it off, she comes back, sit down. This would go on every time there was a State of the Union address. But she never failed to watch one, but they always made her mad. I remember uh, my 18th birthday came just before the 1988 election, and she took me down to the Secretary of State because she was going to use me to get an extra vote for Mondale, and, uh, <laughs> because that was who she was, and and you know she she and she told me how to vote. She you know I was raised as a Democrat, you know that's that's just how it was. As I voted for Clinton, I even voted for Kerry, and I remember. Gross. I know, right? <laughs> I know, right? But I remember the election. <laughs> I remember the election with Pardon with Bush, direction. and I remember his brother overtaking the election in Florida, and with the the whole Chad thing. And I remember how angry I got. Uh, yeah, I voted for uh, uh, Gore as well. Uh, but I remember how angry I got. Humans control the earth. When when this whole thing went on with you know him actually winning the popular vote and Bush getting the election, I remember I got angry at that point, and that was when I began to look into the system and I began to really see beyond what was was apparent and what was you know what was given to us or I don't know what the what the word is, but I began to look past you know the the 
presented image exactly. of the world. Exactly. And, uh, you know, and it, it was kind of an evolution at that point. Um, my my late husband and I, I mean, we both kind of went through this 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 evolution of, of going, both of us were raised as, as, as blue-collar Democrats, and we, we went through this, this evolution into realizing that, you know, the freedom that we were looking for and voting for wasn't being given to us time after time after time, and that... Like Charlie Brown in the uh, football. Yeah, exactly, exactly, <laughs> and that's, that's how I came here, and that's... Well... I have no issue with it. I'd just like to say that, um... Shut up. <laughs> two, two plus two equals four. And this shit's logical. So yes. don't... I, I think there's some crazy shit going on with... You know, you can see we were talking a lot about the presidential elections because you basically we don't... not five. We don't give a fuck we about the presidential Trump's going to make America great again. <laughs> but anyway, but what I'm saying, two plus two is not five. And it doesn't matter if it's you and I talking. I don't have the right to, to hurt you or aggress upon you. And neither you can extrapolate that I don't have the right to aggress on you all the way up to the police, to the government. So just logic is logic. doesn't matter if it's, you know, on a national level, so, suppose it, or, or between, you know, your next-door neighbor. And I think I see a change in... You know, and the people today, and I think now is the time to really, you know, educate your friends and your neighbors and people you meet on the street because people aren't looking at it from the Democrat, Republican, false dichotomy bullshit anymore. Television. Are you kidding? People me? are not nearly as much as they have been. Are you serious? I'm very serious that there is a sea change, and I think we should. There is. I well, think we should really... Independence I, it's is... It's a call is, to action. I, I think people should really try to, to, to reach out to other people. I see a lot of a lot of changes, and hopefully we can, uh, you know, take this bullshit and wake people up. When we were at the fest, yeah. and, and I think we should wrap up on this point, because this is a whole other topic for another show, but when we were at the fest, um, Adam Kokesh... We came and there was probably, I don't know, 45, 50 people in the audience. And he asked for a show of hands, you know, how many people became anarchists within like the last three years or something. And like 90% of the hands went up. The vast majority of people are, who are anarchists are new anarchists. There's an explosion in the quantity of us. Young ones. And, uh, yeah, I heard my sister last yeah. night and it's like, I felt like telling her what I was told a couple of years ago. It's like, you're going to be an anarchist real soon. You know, it was just over two years ago where I really decided that that's... So, if, if you're watching at home that, and you're not an anarchist, you might be real soon, too. How many of you can say that you came to this understanding in the last five years? Wow. What does that tell you? Okay. you Growing. Growing. Do you guys, it's happening! <laughs> Thank you. I was looking for the right words for that. Yes, it's happening! Now, we take this down to a much more conservative estimate from the bias of people who are coming to events right now. From my experience out around the country, and I hope for those of you who are connected to the movement online, that you can, it's pretty safe to say, over half of us got here in the last five years.